Okay, this brings us to lecture 69, Newton's proof of Kepler's second law. So we're going to look at the way that Newton did it. Last time we looked at a kind of a modern treatment of Kepler's second law, reminding you that Kepler's second law basically says planets sweep out equal areas in equal time. So I've written up here at the top. So this point is uh, addressed in Newton's work, which you can find in this nice compendium here, edited by Stephen Hawking. Has so he addresses it in his Theorem 1, Newton's Theorem 1. All orbiting bodies describe by radii having been constructed to their center, areas proportional to the times. So, just like we did in the last lecture, he used uh, a circle, right, as the basis to uh, demonstrate this uh, second, uh, the new Kepler's second law. Okay, so here I've, I've drawn an elliptical orbit, or my best elliptical orbit that I can draw anyhow, um, and I've introduced some broken the path up into some little polygons. You can see these little triangles here. Okay, so what Newton did is he approximated the, the curved elliptical path as a series of little triangles, actually an infinite number of infinitely small triangles. That's one of the, the key ideas uh, behind his dynamics. And so if we look at the point A, as the particle of the planet moves from point A to B, it's moving, it's just an inertial or rectilineal path, okay? It's experiencing no force at all. It's just traveling at a constant velocity in a constant direction. When it gets to the point B, it feels an impulse, okay? Right. And this impulse diverts its path in the direction of C. Okay, and we'll talk more about that uh, later, but uh, that's what's going on there. This dotted line you see going to lowercase c is, this would be if it had continued on in its rectilineal motion, okay? So that's like an inertial path. So there's no force. If there were no force acting, this is where it would wind up. This line, uppercase C, lowercase c, is parallel to the line SB, okay? And then at point C, it again receives another impulse, which causes it to turn yet again. It changes its direction, okay? And head towards this new point, uppercase D. The point, lowercase D, is where it would have wound up had it just continued on in a straight line with no impulse, okay? So this is what Newton is trying to do. He's trying to approximate the curved elliptical path of an orbit by an infinite number of little triangles like this that are infinitely small, okay? That's the general idea. They call it the polygonal approximation. Okay, first I want to mention Galileo's equal areas and equals time, equal time theorem. So this is a result for just pure rectilineal motion. So we just have a particle moving in a straight line, and that's all it's doing. And we pick some arbitrary point, which I'll label S, and if we draw a line, from S to each point along the particle's trajectory where the time between point A and point B is equal. So these are equal time intervals. So how far has it traveled during that time period? Well, the velocity times the time gives us the distance. So this is a V delta T. And since the velocity is constant, each of these distances, A to B, B to C, C to D, etc., are equal to V delta T. Now, the distance, if you, if, excuse me, the distance from this line to this dotted line I've drawn here, right, I'll indicate as, we'll just call this distance h. And it's somewhat arbitrary, right, it depends on where we put s, but it's a constant, as you can see. And you might remember that the definition for the area of a triangle, right, so the area of a triangle is equal to one-half base times height. So if I draw a triangle like, say, this, there we go, where this distance here is the base, the height, I have to extend this line out and drop down a perpendicular, I should make it a dotted line, huh, to the base, this is a right angle, this is the height. And so the area of that triangle is one half the base times the height. And so if we look at the areas of each of these individual triangles, they each have the same base, V delta T but they also have exactly the same altitude, h. And so we call this a1, and this a2, and this a3, a4, and a5. Then we see that they're all equal to each other, right? And so this is the equal areas and equal time theorem. So you could write that delta, that's, yeah, that's right, delta a. Don't confuse the triangle with the delta. Delta a over delta t. Actually, let's do it this way. The change in area is equal to one-half the base, which is V delta T, times the height H, 
divide out delta t, put it over here. That leaves me with one half v times h. V is constant by definition. We said we're considering a constant velocity. H is always a constant as well. And so you can see that delta A over delta T is a constant. So equal area and equal time. So that's Galileo's equal area and equal time theorem. So now let's look at how Newton uh, approached Kepler's equal area and equal time theorem. OK, so I've drawn the first few points. So A, B, and the lowercase c from the first figure we looked at, where we approximated the elliptical orbit. And note that the time interval between A and B and B and C are equal time intervals. That was something I think I forgot to mention at the beginning, is that we created these triangles with equal time intervals in them. Okay? Um, and so what we want to show here, right, is that the triangle ASB and the triangle BSC are equal. Okay? And that's almost trivially so. It's basically following from Galileo's equal area theorem. Right? If you look at this... The distance, in, as I've drawn it here anyways, SA is the height, and the base of each of these triangles is this V delta T again, you see? And so we have, in kind of a trivial way, uh, that the area of triangle ASB is equal to the area triangle BS. C. So it's at this point that we want to construct, remember the next line over was where we have the impulsive force, right? So we need to put the impulsive force in. So what's going on with that impulsive force? Well, we've got some velocity v, right? And we apply a little delta v, okay? That's really a little, right, a little bit bigger. Delta v, okay? Yeah. So what is this delta v? This is, a, this is from the impulse that we were talking about before, right? And it's, it's from a the line that connects the planet and the source of this force. In this case, we're thinking of like the sun, okay? okay. So the line that connects these two is the direction of delta V, right? And so what happens when we do, well, let me draw it a little more general so that it's not perpendicular like this, but let's say that we had, we're maybe considered the point B because it's now directed this way, right? So the delta V is kind of like this. Here's our original velocity v, right? So we use the parallelogram rule, right? We construct the parallelogram like so, and then we go from here to here. This is our kind of v prime, so to speak. And that's what takes us to the next point, uppercase c, which will actually lie somewhere over here, let's say. We need a line that's perpendicular, or excuse me, parallel to sb between C and this new point, uppercase C. So I'd say it's like something like this. Okay? All right. And so now we can construct this line. Let me just draw it a little more realistic how it would look. Something like that. There we go. We've already shown that the ASB and the BS uppercase or BS lowercase c triangles have equal area, right? Yes. What we need to do now is show that BS lowercase c and BS uppercase c also have equal areas. And so how do we do that? Well, let me just make a little room here. We can construct or drop down, I'm going to extend, move this point over here, B. I'm going to extend this line out like this. So this is just an extension of the line SB. Okay? And I'm going to drop a perpendicular down from here. So that's a right angle. And this we'll just call it H. It doesn't matter exactly what it is. But we can do the same thing from the point C, right? This distance from this line to the point C is the same as this distance from the point uppercase C to this line. So there's our right angle again. This is also H. So we can think of H as the altitude for these triangles, right? So what's the area of the triangle um, B 
S uppercase C. B S uppercase C. Well, it's one half times the base. Well, the base is just the distance S B. S B. And the altitude is H. See that? What is the area for the triangle B S lowercase c? Well, that's one half. What's the base of that triangle? Can you see that triangle? It's a little bit hard to make it out, but uh, it's basically this triangle here, goes up here, and then it goes down here. Can you see it now? I just draw over it. That's the triangle we're talking about now, right? And so its base is also SB, right? And its height is this same distance H here. Okay? So you see that these two are equal, so we have that the area of BSC is equal to the area of BS lowercase c, right? Yeah. But we already had, that, this should have been lowercase c, as I've written it. We already have that the area of BS lowercase c is equal to the area of ASB, right? Yeah. Well, through the transitive property, right? If two things are equal to the same thing, then they're equal to each other, right? That tells us that the area of the triangle ASB, which is equal to the area of the triangle BS lowercase c, which is equal to the area of this, the area of BS uppercase c. So that's telling me that this area is the same as this area. Okay? Okay. Now if we continue that to the next point, D, and then E, and then F, and then G, and then all the way around, and we let these triangles become infinitesimal in size, that means infinitely small, then this will be true for the area of the curved orbits. Yeah, so in, in that limit we're letting the, the delta T, or the, the time interval, become infinitely small. Yeah. Right? These triangles, right? Remember, so the, the time is, is actually proportional to the area here, right? Yeah. That's what's going on. That's what he's setting out to prove. Okay, that the areas are proportional to the times. Because the base of these triangles is V delta T, right? So we can then show that the area is proportional to delta T, yes? Yeah. And so since we showed it is true for these triangles, in the limit that these triangles become infinitely small, it will also be true for the areas of the curved paths. Well, I mean, the curved paths are a little bit different than the triangles, right? Because they're curvy. These are composed of all straight lines, okay? But as you make these, you know, an infinite number of these triangles, these straight lines approximate little pieces of the curved lines, okay? And so this is how Newton got at equal areas in equal time uh, for Kepler's uh, second law, okay? pretty straightforward. Um, it's a, a good example of the kind of the way that Newton did his proofs and his derivations, right? Yeah. It's almost purely geometrical. You can almost imagine seeing it, you know, as another chapter in Euclid's book or a Apollonius's book. Um, but he makes that big leap about the infinitesimal, right? So we allow these triangles to become infinitely small, okay? So that they approximate, well, not, they, not just approximate, but they become the same as the area described by the curved shape, you see? Yeah. Um, if, if that's really hard to, to wrap your mind around, just imagine trying to draw a circle from a polygon. I mean, a square is a really bad approximation for a circle, right? So you might then try a hexagon or an octagon. Octagon is starting to look more like a circle, right? If you allow it to be an n-gon, where n is, in, is infinity, right, then that's a perfect circle. Okay? Yeah. The more sides you add to it, the more perfectly circular it becomes. And that's essentially what's going on here. But So he's shown it for the polygon case, right? We, it's all, we always draw the triangles really big so that you can see what's going on as far as the altitude and the bases and stuff like that go. But in reality, the, we're imagining that they're really, t you know, quite small. Okay, so that uh, this approximation where an n-gon, where n is infinity, becomes a perfect circle or a perfect ellipse, uh, 
becomes exact. Okay? All right. So it's a kind of an imaginative leap. Uh, it's also backed by, you know, really solid mathematics, but we're not going to get into that. That's essentially what calculus is. Okay? This is the basis of calculus. Um, but it's not how most people learn it, but it is what it is. Okay, uh, so this is Newton's proof of Kepler's second law. Okay? Right. And uh, at least for the case of a, a circular orbit. I don't know that he ever really treated it specifically for an elliptical orbit, trying to show that uh, you get equal areas at equal times. Uh, you, I, you don't think it would be hard to do, but uh, you may not have done it for whatever reason. But So the next thing we'll look at uh, in the next lecture will be Newton's... I deign to say proof, because it's not really what he's setting out to do. Newton regards Kepler's laws as empirical fact. Okay, and he uses that to guide him in the development of his theories. So basically he's saying, well, if these Newton, the, if, if Kepler's laws are fact, right, we must make our physical theories comport to those facts. And so it's a slightly different approach than what traditionally is taken when talking about Kepler's laws and how they relate, how uh, Newton related to them. Okay, they typically say something like, oh, let's derive Kepler's laws from Newton's laws. Well, that's not how it really happened, and that's not really the way that we do it in science. Uh, we take empirical fact, we use that as guidance for our hypotheses, and then we, we go forward with it. Uh, so that's what we'll get to next time. It'll be a little, a little more involved, but not much, not much. So and that's it. <laughs>